Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, first, I'd like to pay respects to the traditional owners and guardians of the land, past and present. And this evening, we'd love to dedicate this evening to Henry Sir, who was mm. a man who worked with Father Bob for 20 years and mm. died unexpectedly on Sunday. So, yeah, no good. No good. Yeah, so it's very sad, but um, mm. he's, he's with us. Mm. Um, so first of all, I just say my name's Sue Williams. I'm a writer, and I my last book was the biography of Father Bob, called very imaginatively, Father Bob. Um, and Father Bob himself kind of no, needs no introduction, really. Um, to some people, he's a bit of a legend. To others, is an icon. To others, is a maverick, a saint, a man of the people, a media whore. Oh, that usually it's a media tart. <laughs> Now, thanks Jesus. to Darren Hinch. Oh, Darren, Darren Hinch. does he call me? Yeah, media hall, sadly. He's a mad other priest. things on his mind now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, you called yourself a mad priest. God, I don't mind that. Yeah, mind that's that. good. Okay. An egotist. Arsonist. And sometimes... <laughs> no, what's that thing? <laughs> a narcissist. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He said yeah. it. I said, I thought you... I never been at the bloody church down at all. <laughs> I'm a narcissist. And to some people, particularly in the church hierarchy, maybe he's public enemy number one or two, depending on who you talk to. But just as he's a bit of a legend himself, some of the stories about Father Bob are quite legendary too. Um, He often talks about Jesus as the founder of the firm. And of course, Jesus could turn water into wine, but Father Bob's the only person I've known who could turn a funeral into a wedding. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, when you... Do you remember that? (laughs) Niall Brennan's grand... No, Niall Brennan's... Daughter, I think it was. That's right. Father Bob officiated at a funeral and in the middle of the funeral asked why the daughter of the bereaved wasn't married to her partner. And I think she was a bit surprised that he asked her that in the middle of the funeral. But in the end, he asked her if she'd like to marry her partner and in the end conducted a makeshift kind of wedding Mm. at the funeral. (laughs) But there's a backstory to that because, in fact... There always is, Father Bob. Elaine (laughs) said to me, that's the mother... Oh, I wish she would marry her. And I said, well, Niall would like that. And I knew Elaine would like it. So I said, well, there we are. Why don't we at least say the words? Mm. See? Fantastic. But it's too gauche to say that I pulled that out of a hat and said, why don't you get married here? Because (laughs) I I don't think I'm as gauche as that. (laughs) There has to be a, the end has to justify the means. Sure. And look, I'm sure they're very happy still, so mm. that's great. I'm getting a bit protective of self. Right. Now. Okay. Not, not because of you, but in the book, because yep, yep. you've got to be. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of other funerals that Father Bob's worked at. Um, obviously, he's very well known for um, the story about knocking on the casket. That's a legend. To check that anybody's there. A few people have told me that story as well. Legend. And telling people at the funeral. Cheer up. Why does everybody look so sad? He's the one who's dead. You're not dead. (laughs) Be happy and celebrate life. And of course, you're quite a sharp person. One of my favourite things in the book, one of my favourite story was um, after Kerry Packer, the late Kerry Packer, had his first heart attack at the Polo in Sydney. And we've just seen that episode on Paper Giants on TV again. We've just seen that. The, what happened there and afterwards Kerry Packer was said to have died for six minutes then he was revived and uh, he was said to say to come back and people said to him you know what did you see you died is there anything there and he said no there's effing nothing there you can do whatever you want in this life because there's nothing at the other side so it really doesn't matter and when that quote was put to Father Bob he looked I think quite hard at the interviewer and said I think that says more about God's judgment on Kerry Packer (laughs) than it does on what truly awaits most of us on the other side. But Father Bob has so many supporters and people who have worked with him over the years and they're all obviously immensely loyal and some of them, you know, it was quite hard to extract extract some of these stories from them. But I guess one of my favourite supporter stories... Mm. (laughs) Go on. ..was... um, a long-time helper of, of Father Bob, who um, was always very keen to, to help and actually has given some money over the years to help set up some of the scholarships that he operates. 
And um, he told me about how he used to be the local bank manager. And one of the young men that Father Bob was helping came to see him in the bank one day. And the guy looked at him and was about to have a chat to him. And then the boy pulled out a gun and held him up at gunpoint. <laughs> but um, the man just, um, I mean, he's quite a tough guy, isn't he? And he just belted the boy, grabbed the gun, and emptied the bullets. And he still has the bullets today. And he just told him to, to get out, and that was it. No, nothing, nothing more ever happened. So it can be kind of hard to be one of your supporters at times, I'm mm. sure. But you, you still have an awful lot of them out there, really. And starting to write this book about Father Bob, I mean, a lot of his life is a bit of an open book anyway. You know, you, you have so much of a media profile. But actually, when I started writing and talking to your family and people around you, I discovered, you know, you had a really interesting kind of early life as well, which many of us hadn't known anything about. So I wanted to ask you about your childhood, because you were the youngest of uh, four children. Your parents came over from Ireland um, in search of a better life. But what Five, was... wasn't it? Four? Five. Well, yeah, one died very early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But still, she got onto the track. No, that's right. Um, you can see what it's like to be his biographer, can't it's you? It's true, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing... <laughs> yeah, you know, the really press says, you know, it's four. Me. I'm saying, no, well, wasn't it? It's five. <laughs> she lived to be one. Yes, yes. She died in Poor childhood. Poor Marguerite. Anyway, so... Encephalitis, wasn't it? Or somebody called that uh, infant... Encephalitis. Uh, was it? Or... Yeah, whatever. Meningitis. Infant yeah. so anyway, meningitis. So tell us about your childhood. What was it like? I don't remember because it, I, I wasn't there. Right. <laughs> I was uh, growing up. I, I don't remember much. You see, people say, but why didn't you know? Because you've got a chapter in there that, uh, that's about blood on the wall. My, my brother would have told you about those mm. episodes, sure. about the drunken father yeah. and all that kind of thing. But up until that time, see, I can't remember that much because we moved around a terrible lot, I remember. And mm. Later trying to work out how you, why did you move from, where were we, Thornbury down to Black Rock, to Black Rocks and killed us and killed at a Pridham Street Paran, is because we, we never paid the rent. Mm. Yeah. See what I mean? Yep. yep. That's what they said about that musician who said, Something's oh, yes, all changed. your music is played in flats. He said, yeah, because we never paid the rent in the first one. So, <laughs> da 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 da. Flats. Do you get that? Yeah, thank you, thank you. But I mean, that was my. We went around, I remember you see, and I can't remember much being pushed in pushes and all that stuff. And um, I really can't remember as a child, child, you know, I'd love it to be able to, to, to tell lies, uh, to um, <laughs> tell child stories. But the first yeah. time I woke up, I suppose, what? No, I suppose it must have been pre just before going to school. What's mm. that, five, six is it, years of age? Mm. And going to primary school and all that kind of stuff. But no, I haven't got, I'm very sad about that. Yeah. Might be dementia, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it could be, couldn't it? Because. Uh, well, you were very, you were the youngest at the time, so it's kind of, it's likely that your brothers and sisters remembered it much more than mm. you. Because I guess your dad was a drinker, he'd been in the Navy yeah, for a long time. Yeah, he was in and out of the sea. place. Mm. Yeah, but she was a, 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 the, the, the diminutive mother. So you mm. can't. I mean, God knows they were dead by the time I was 10 or 11 or 12, wasn't it? Mm, that's right. And I'm trying to remember. People say, but you must remember. And I can't remember. Mm, yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Because probably also because of... I turned feral early. Mm. <laughs> See what I mean? Because, I suppose because of the survival thing. You know what I mean? Um, and that's been... I mean, I'm feral tonight. You have to... You know, how are you going to get out? No, no, no. <laughs> Bloody stairs, have to get down there. You know? There's 250 people and you left it. Uh, you know what I mean? But that yeah. goes back to being, you know what I mean? Yeah. Trying to survive from an early age. Yeah, because, I mean, you had a very poor childhood. Well, I mean, we you had poor, no but I mean, this really. is not Monty Python. Uh, <laughs> you know, that marvellous story about, you reckon you were poor? Well, listen to this, you know what I mean? You yeah. can always out, we could run around got 250 stories of childhood poverty. You know what I mean? Ah, oh, we only had plasma television, you know. <laughs> it's like the Australian economy, isn't it? She's going to go to the wall tonight, poor bugger, over the, what? The richest country in the universe, for God's sake. You know what I mean? And all the legislation that's been passed has been good for us, and yet they're going to throw her out. See what I mean? It's all mm. perception. Mm. And my perception of those days was, I suppose, we had to have a look. See? Fat. Mm. Mm. So I probably even was a fat baby, I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> with dripping, because we had dripping. You remember the yeah. hands up those? Do you remember the dripping? Or the tomato on the, uh, not the tomato sauce? See? And if you were lucky, you, 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 you rose a little bit above that to what? I told you before, treacle. Wasn't it mm. treacle? Um, that green tin. What was in the green tin? Golden syrup. No, that was the gold tin. Uh, the, uh, 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 what do you call it? Malt extract, wasn't it? Mm. See, that kind of stuff. And don't if forget, it weren't everybody well, here is much younger than you. Yeah, I know, but I mean, that's what Safran keeps saying. Don't bore the kiddies because they won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> See? Well, I'm simply saying if they don't know the, 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 this history, isn't it? Mm. When we did learn to depend on one another, you had to. She had to go next door, get, a, get some sugar. She had to go next door, or next door came inside when they knew the drunken father was coming down the street, or my sisters were told by a rich kid up the street, you better come up the street. Why? Because your father's drunk in the gutter. Bit of fun, bit of mm. banter, bit of bullying, you'd say, wouldn't you? Mm. Huh? No texting and all that stuff. Mm. Or Facebook, in those days, it was getting you down mm. and dirty. So with yep. it. Drag the body along the street, old Jim, put mm. him in number 47 Pridham Street. Yeah. And then uh, go as quickly as you could. Yep. Or give a bit of shelter poor, to poor old Annie, I suppose, while the old man woke up out of his drunken stupor and uh, declaimed, um, to die, to sleep, a chance to dream. And mm. in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Mm. Now, I mean, drunken all as he was, the fact of the matter is he, he was articulate. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what do you want? You can't have everything in this world, can you? You know what I mean? <laughs> and I had a cousin, Frank, who came out. He was 86, not out. Deaf as a post. And, um, uh, my God, you only had to push the right button and you got the same declamations out of Frank. Right. Now, it must be a goddamn rogue gene <laughs> in the Maguire... <laughs> Whatever it's yeah. called, you know? Mm. Because as I think it's, you enjoyed school because you went there often to get, you know, away from the family yes. home. Yes. But it's well, hard to believe... Well, rather than get away from it, you went towards something. Mm. You see? So you went towards... Like, kids like kids now, I presume, do they go to school? You say, oh, he's going to get away from his home. Yeah, but, I mean, that's negative. The, the mm. positive is that there's something else, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Something else. So you know that the peer group will probably be, um, well, you won't have to argue with them mm, yeah, for start. Yeah. You're little boys and girls, so you They're can same enjoy you. childhood, you know. Mm. I mean, uh, and you, also there was, a, there was not a clash of cultures in those days up at Armadale Primary School. I think there was a, what do you call it, there was a meeting of cultures. There mm. was the rich kids from Armadale and there was the poor kids from Paran. Mm. And we got on together. In fact, what's his name who works down at my place now? Brian Armin, who's mm. 79. We sat in the, in, in the same row of desks at Armadale back in 1940, mm. God knows what, mm. because we had solidarity. You know what I mean? At school, that's where this whole mm. s m mythology started, you see, that uh, why is he interested in looking? Because, I mean, that's what we were interested in when we were 10. So we got onto something. Like Higgs boson. So is this what you're talking about, your do-it-yourself yeah. strategy? Because nobody well, would do stuff for you. Well, nobody else is going to do it for yeah. you, for God's sake. So you got together with you Brian You want to stay Harman. out of boys' homes in those days, you had to stick together and do good things. But we were only little. So we knocked on the door of the presbytery, knock, 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 and old Jimmy McHugh, the priest in there, grumpy, that's where I got it from probably. <laughs> oh, grumpy, it'd be coming, he can't see Father because he's busy, all that stuff. Oh, the dragon was the housekeeper. So we eventually, I think if we went knock, knock enough times during the day, Jimmy McHugh came out and we said, we need a place to, to kind of get together. And Who are we little socialists? Age 10, mm. you know, got everything on except the, the armband, you know. We want that to get into that parish house over around the corner, magnificent house in Winstay Avenue. I can see it now. And he said, no, 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 you can't do that because the older men have the use of the place. See, typical, typical clerical exclusion. You can't have it because the others are... Mm. And we said, well, we need it, see, to our... You know what I mean? We need to stay off the streets or we're buggered. 
So, like all those other kids who disappeared from the street neck, where'd they go? Boys, though. So, so you form, form, formed a couple of teams, football and cricket yeah, teams. Yeah, we started to think called the Prorand Rovers. Mm. You know? And uh, we didn't have a web page. No. <laughs> Didn't have any of that. Yep. It was all done through, let's meet somewhere, we're going to meet. Oh, that nice, that boy's daddy will let us in. See, it's all networking. See, it's who you know, not what you know. Mm. See what I mean? That's the solution to all these problems of the Commonwealth of Australia, is to form little commonwealths, mm. you see, of um, East Coburg or something. See, but we're relying on the Western model of, uh, she'll be right, we'll have a democracy. Mm. We'll have a, you know, we'll have a union. No, you won't. You're better off having a confederation, where each place accept responsibility for doing its own things. Rosebud should be doing Rosebud's best things, not waiting for 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 for, uh, for uh, the state government. Mm. See, well, you know, we're now going through hell down there, our place, because in fact some genius is going to redevelop for Fisherman's Bend, aren't they? We're all going to live up in the air and. The new school down there, where we well, there's no space to play. Don't worry about it. We'll all go up in the air. <laughs> and the playground will be up in the air. <laughs> Everything's going to go up in the air, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which means that we'll never meet again. <laughs> we'll spend our whole lives up in the bloody air, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that's what's missing, see, is the press the flesh. Mm. You see? It's hard to believe that when you is were school, boring? apparently you were so... It's boring. She's bored. She just walked out, that girl. <laughs> There's no collection, by the way. <laughs> somebody said when I, when I arrived, they said, listen, let's do something religious. I said, what? She said, have a collection. I said, what the cheeky girl? <laughs> I'm not interested in only in money. It's hard to imagine when you were at school, apparently you were incredibly quiet and amazingly meek. Yeah. What happened? What? How comes you changed so much? Oh, well, a lot of your teachers who I spoke to well, said they just couldn't kid, believe suppose, what he'd become. Oh, I don't know. People keep saying that. But over the years, well, you, you grow up. Mm. You have to. Mm. So when, when you're a kid and you, you really believe that you're born with a scrap of what? DNA. Unique. Each one of us has got the scrap. You know, that's what babies are born. Like this, you know. <laughs> well, they got their fingers. Well, they don't do that. This one's now like that. A scrap of DNA, you know, and the other one's now like this, waiting to convey the text. <laughs> Isn't it? As soon as they've got it, and they usually don't get it until they're teenagers. <laughs> See what I mean? Because you go through the stage of being a kid and quiet and all that. Well, you've got to be quiet as a kid, you see, to make sure that you've, your little scrap is still yours. Sure. And then you look for somebody who'll get you through the next episode, which is, what is the next episode? Is uh, adolescence, isn't it? Mm. And then you're looking for a mentor. Now, if you're lucky, you get good mentors. If you're not lucky, you get predators. Mm. <laughs> see what I mean? And they're yeah. not all the clergy, are they? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then as you get older, still with a mentor, if you're lucky, and you've still got the scrap. You've still got your mm. little contribution to cosmic development mm. in there. It's, it's yours, you know what I mean? Why aren't you playing the piano? You know what I mean? Because you should be playing the piano, the thing yeah. says here. Well, I should be playing the bloody violin, according to my scrap. Mm. See what I mean? Because the old man was a, was a violinist. Musician, he turned yeah. into a drunk because he used to, go to try to get away from his dominating mother in Glasgow, went down the hill to the local pub at 18 years of age, played the piano, and the locals bought him drinks. See mm. what I mean? Mm. So that's the backstory. Yeah. So this kid, each of us has got it. Get to teenage with your mentor, hopefully, and then you have to then become, uh, what you, you've got to become independent even of the mentor. Mm. See? Because your mentors were mostly priests, weren't they? No, the main, but, but no, no, I think most of my mentors, don't criticise, is uh, <laughs> no, the woman next door, Mrs Wilson, she was great. Mm. You know, she looked after my mother. She was a mentor. She didn't have to look after my mother. Yeah. She was compassionate. I think that's the thing. If you can yeah. learn compassion, mm. will probably be the next stage of the evolution of the human race. Let's I mean, so. after Syria. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody's going to have to show compassion somewhere, you know, mm. because we're going through an, an evolutionary stage of flog and hang them, mm. isn't it? I think Victoria wants to flog and hang them all now, don't they? 
no paroles, no this, no that, we're going to have a punitive uh, justice, and somebody says, excuse me, yes, what about trying truth and reconciliation? Don't be bloody stupid. Flog and hang them. It's easier, isn't it? Let's build bigger and bigger bigger prisons mm. and warehouse them all. Mm. See what I mean? Don't let them out. You know what I mean? So talking of prisons, yeah. that's when you went to the seminary. Well, that's when you, yeah, I, I glided into the cemetery, I was going to say the cemetery, into the seminary, I glided in there. Look, people keep saying, how did you get you have appearance of Mary or something? He said, Bobby, Bobby, I want you to be a priest. No, no. I think it was a, another evolutionary step because um, there wasn't anywhere else to go. Let's be on a realist. Because by then your dad had died. They're your all dead. Your sister had died, your mother had died. They're all dead. Yeah. Oh, and except Eileen was alive. Your sister, and yeah. And Jimmy was alive. Yeah, your um, brother, older yeah, brother. Yeah, but they're all gone mm. to war. She's gone to, uh, to the munition factory mm. in, where is it? Over there in... Um, Maribyrnong, thank you. She's over there making bullets mm. and shells and stuff. He's away up north, uh, fixing up aeroplanes to stop the Japanese or something. Mm. And then you're at a secondary school where for once in your life... Um, what happens there? Oh, you go into the cadet corps, mm, which was yep. nice, see, because all of a sudden you fit in. Yeah. Everybody's equal. They were all walking around those bloody stupid uniforms. And you quite like giving orders. Didn't I like to. Now, I like taking orders for a start because you never had any, you see. You didn't, didn't have anybody to order you around. Mm. You, had, uh, you had no mentor. Mm. So by the time you get into you've got... Well, you learn to take orders and then you realise this is a damn good thing because you've got to have somebody who leads. Mm. And the Aussie, the Aussie male form of leadership at its best was always the digger. But it was never the officer with the rank. It was always the least likely private. Mm. They found it happened all over the place and during World War II that the, the soldier in the, in, the, um, in the trench or the soldier in the jungle... Uh, sir might be a fool, the warrant officer might be an idiot, but you always had private so-and-so who led, had moral leadership, you know what I mean? And it's the same, that's what we're looking for, isn't it, in, in Civvy Street now, see? But we're all frightening one another, and we don't want to get involved, I know, oh, but he was just run, like the baby in China, you saw that video, the baby was run over by a motor car, mm -hmm. and they're all standing looking. Another car comes along, but run the baby over a second time. They're still looking, you see, till eventually some woman comes out of nowhere, the least likely, uh, the gloriously ordinary woman, the same kind who interfered in, uh, in Woolwich. Remember mm -hmm. that? With the big blokes. Well, they're all standing around with guns. What's the woman do in Woolwich? Excuse me, boys, would you mind explaining what you're trying to do? So they've got knives with blood on them and they, <laughs> you know, but the woman comes and wants to be a people whisperer. The other women come out of the side of the wings, isn't it? Like in a Shakespearean play and puts a cloth over, isn't it? Or puts a coat over the dead body. Mm. Huh? See? And that's what we're missing. You see? The blokes, you see, want to, want to, want to, what? Physically intervene all the time. Whereas the most important intervention, that's where your moral digger comes from, corporal or private so-and-so in the jungle in New Guinea, would have been the bloke who somehow or another were divinely blessed with some gift where, he, uh, uh, where leadership is, 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 is caught, not taught, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We know we can rely on this bloke or on this woman. You know what I mean? You're so we learnt that from the cadets, you see. I think we learnt yeah. it in the cadets because... For once, you actually were thrown in with a bunch of, of your peers, all steamy adolescents, and all walking around in huge great coats. And I was so thinking the other day, I think, you know, to think of the gun laws these days, we used to actually go home on the buddy tram with a 303. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we were minus the, what do you call the, the bolt. Mm. But we used to go home with this gun, we were entrusted with this gun. And um, on we got on the tram and people more or less probably would give us the, 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 the eye as though we were kind of responsible 15-year-olds, you know, which was nice. And then we used to go away to camps together, mm. you know what I mean? And um, 
make a note of this. I used to, I was proficient at, at the, um, what was it Book's called? That, that thing used to wrap your hands around the candles. What's that? The Vickers machine gun. The thing with mm. the hose coming out, the oh, yeah. water cooled. That was your favourite, I think. Well, that's what mm. I qualified in. I mean, whether mm. it's my favourite or not, you have to make do with what you've got, isn't it? Yeah. The others were carrying around big Bren, what is it called? Bren guns, right. wasn't it? Mm. Big things. Like, oh, you know, all that. No, smart Bobby. He was sitting on the ground with this thing. Bugger <laughs> <laughs> that. You know, you know what I mean? So we did a bit of that, and I found, I suppose what I'm saying is the mentor thing for teenagers, which is missing now, um, is in fact, um, uh, what? You learn skills. And I also learned that I wasn't too bad at explaining things to people. So you became mm. a corporal or something, and then all of a sudden you... Yeah, that's I got the badge. Now you have to do the work. See, you've got 20, 20 teenagers sitting around and you've got the stripes and you've got to explain the, uh, mm. um, the elongation on the, that of the left side plate. Mm. See, which you can remember even to today, more or less. See? Oh, yes. So your peer group, what do you call it? Um, uh, you're, you're, you're learning by, by osmosis. Mm. See? So the peer group learns. So you say up there in that suburb, no names, there's a peer group out tonight who are going to wreck the place. Isn't it? Burn the place down. That's peer group pressure. Now, one of them, if they were being, as we hope to do with our foundation, is to try to offer some kind of, uh, what, late, late uh, education in humanity, humanism, so that every, 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 every bunch of teenagers will have at least one that knows she can show another way, see? So it'll spread, you see? So that's what I, I've, I got from cadets. I was delighted with cadets. And then all of a sudden, you were apparently, somebody said, oh, he's good at this. So they give you a peak cap and a cane, I remember. Those things that the British officers used to walk around with under your arm. You, you actually considered a, a like career that. in the army, didn't well, you? Well, I wanted to go to in a Duntroom, but I couldn't would... get there because I had no money and I didn't know anybody. Mm. So it's what you do, you know. Yeah. And you could have gone to university as well, but you didn't you have the money You could have either. gone to, you couldn't have no money. But the big way mm. out for the Roman Catholics in those days, because don't forget, this is before we became uh, um, uh, wealthy. The Catholic Church is now filthy rich. But in those days, we were still, the, what do you call it, the um, persecuted minority. In the 40s, I'm talking, and 50s. So we're still ghetto-minded. We're going back there, but, I mean, in those days, we were ghetto-minded. We had to look after our own interests. So, um, yeah, the, the thing that you... I think Catholics were drifting into, especially boys, were drifting into the uh, public service, wasn't it? And there were half a dozen departments that was dominated by Roman Catholic men, and the other half was dominated by others. So, you know, the customs department was, was well known to be dominated by Roman Catholics and other departments, taxation, were dominated by Roman Catholics. It was, all, it was well known, you know. Mm. And the, the coppers were Protestants. Well, not Protestants, but dominated by the Freemasons or whatever. But, I mean, it wasn't, you know, nobody took it askance. It was presumed that an evolving society mm. that you would have, you know, not get... Well, you like to think it's government by the people, for the people, and of the people, but we all know that's crap. It's the one percent who runs the country, and it's the 99 percent who followed the leader, isn't it? I mm. believe. Yeah. So that, yeah, I could have gone into the public service with... What, what do they call that in the, the Commonwealth Scholarship, I think we had? At the end, if you weren't a complete dud, you got a Commonwealth scholarship and you go into the next episode. See what I mean? So instead, you went uni, to the seminary. You couldn't go to easily. Usually, you couldn't go to uni easily because you didn't yeah. have the money. Yeah. So, so in the end, the seminary became a bit of a default position. In well, I suppose so. I don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting to get to the other side until somebody explains the bloody thing to me. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah, you know, I'm a believer in the cosmic thing, you know, and there's an explanation, mm. uh, you know. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, I, I don't want to worry too much about how it all happened. But, uh, yeah, you <laughs> drifted in, but you had a mate. Once again, there's a mate. He said, I said, where are you going you know, Because I don't want to know. I can't seem to work out how to get to Duntroon. He said, well, I'm going down to Corpus Christi. Because uh, we were, you know, that school at that time, we were happy that Catholicism was highly intellectual as well as being compassionate. Highly intellectual because we had a few teachers actually thought their way through 
Catholicism, and it wasn't all just, you know, ladles full of devotions and ladles full of moralising. It was mm-hmm. thoughtful, you know. There were blokes making diagrams on... I remember the blackboard, and they had this connected with that and we're connected with this, and we go, oh, God, we were very impressed that Catholicism might, in fact, have as much in- intricacy and bl- complexity about it as the... Uh, as the What was that thing called, that table that gives you the... Uh, yeah. That thing. All of that is tables of chemistry and fit. I said, this thing is as glorious, ordinarily glorious, gloriously ordinary, isn't it? Mm. Catholicism. And this mm. is before Vatican II. Mm. See? This is after the golden age of, of, of the boys coming back from the war and saying uh, that was the beginning of the age of prosperity, wasn't it, in Australia? Because the boys came back equals, mm. didn't they? Mm. So they had access to education, didn't they? Through, return, through um, their privileges as returned servicemen. They had access to health benefits, didn't they? And they had war service homes, wasn't it? So they made a social leap if they survived the war. You know what I mean? And uh, that's 40s and 50s and maybe 60s. And then on top of that sense of secular prosperity... Mm. You had Vatican II that came and said, hey, listen, Catholicism, she's not keeping up as fast as she was showing form, so we better throw the bloody windows open and let the air in Mm. because secularism is galloping ahead and secularism just might have a few tricks to teach Catholicism. Mm. Now, that's been the the fight ever since, and that's what the book's about. See, Mm. is will the Catholic Church, which should be at its spartus, it should know, that there's something else on the track which, in fact, is showing bit more form than Catholicism or any religion, and that is secularism. You know what I mean? So we were brought up to be afraid that secularism was a, was a toxin, whereas we now know, of course, that secular... Even the Dalai Lama said the other day at the thing, didn't he? That secularist, secular, secular values should be taught to everybody because secular mm-hmm. values, in fact have gotten to that level that the churches and the religions were meant to get to, but in fact they wouldn't let you get there unless you became ex- exclusively religious. See? Whereas uh, secularism offers you freedom of religion but also freedom from religion, isn't it? Is this, is this boring? It is boring. <laughs> Sue, come and help us. <laughs> <laughs> Help us, for God's sake. Okay, let's, 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 let's move forward Lord's to... Lord's 10 to 7. No, that's all right. Let's move forward to you going to South Melbourne. Yeah. You came out of the seminary at 1916. Well, we went on the, you... on the roundabout in those parishes that nobody ever worries mm. much, but that taught me a terrible lot because they kept me on the move. 1960 mm. to, what, 70... Uh, to 69. Uh, so you went around eight parishes and bugger. You see, you knew there was something wrong because they were sending you. So none of this was accidental. They were actually sending you to a place where they wanted you to embarrass the local parish priest. Mm. See, sad, yeah. sad. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they wanted to get rid of the parish priest, but they couldn't because they had to follow the code of canon law, which says the parish priest is the god mm. and can't be moved. See? So they said, oh, we'll let the monkey in. So me, the monkey, a harmless poor bloody monkey in those days, would go in and do simple things like put the lights on the basketball court so kids could play at night, simple things, simple things. Open the tuck shop in the school so the teenagers could come up and, you know, and then you found that the system in place said, no, you can't open the school tuck shop at night because we found a cigarette butt on the ground and the cleaner said he wasn't coming back and, oh, God... So after a while, the parish priest won again, you see, because he said to the bloke in town, well, look, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And they said, right and took me away eight times. Mm. See? So by the time I got to Seymour in 69, I think it was, the offer, the offer came, um, why don't you go into the army next door at Pakapanyal? Because the war was on Vietnam. Unpopular, very unpopular war. Do you remember that? where the hippies all went in to be enlisted because the marble came out or something. With their, with their, and we were only, what, 19? Anybody sing that? I was only 19, wasn't it? Was that? Mm. So we all went in there and the hippies joined up and then uh, the army found that these young men were, in fact, uh, the best, uh, what, soldiers, they said. A few old, gnarled old instructors told me. 
I said, geez, you must find these young people terrible hard to... No, no, he said, these are the best soldiers that I've ever met. Strange, isn't it? So, because they were thoughtful. See what I mean? They were thoughtful. Because you were drafted in to help provide some character Talk. training, Talk, yak, 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 mm. yak. That's what yeah. Blame them. Yeah. Character training courses. The idea was the Yanks had lost in Korea. What is it, 60 years ago? It's 50s, 60, isn't yeah. it? Mm. The Yanks had lost in Korea and they got, they, they were, got beaten by an ideology, mm. not by uh, better weapons or anything. The ideology was Marxist, uh, com- wasn't it? Marxist c- communism, both in China, because the Chinamen came in and joined with North Korea. And they were, the ideology, you see, was too powerful for the, um, the um, what? The weak Western lack of any ideology. Because we like to think that, what, what's the ideology we have? Consumerism, isn't it? Or capitalism <laughs> or something. Well, we think that's an ideology, but she won't stand up to pressure at all. Hmm. She won't. She caves in. So that ideology of, of Marxist, uh, which gave discipline to huge masses, you can see the North Koreans, you see what they go through? Mm. Massing, massing, massing numbers. You see, now once you're confronted with that, for God's sake, you can't. You can't. The Yanks had taken, for God's sake, uh, what do you call a mobile um, a Coca-Cola barrel into uh, into Korea because their soldiers couldn't get on without Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> you see, and in Vietnam they learned that the American soldiers were uh, were, were health hazards because they used to smoke all the time, mm. and they're in the jungle. Mm. See, and the Viet Cong used to know where the Americans were because they could smell the bloody smoke. <laughs> See, and you could say, oh, well, that's capitalism at its best. We don't give a rat's ass where we are. I don't care if I'm in the jungle, I'm going to have a smoke. <laughs> See, bang. <laughs> oh, well, I died free, <laughs> you know. And that's what they were up against, both in Korea. They said, we're not going to do the same in, <laughs> in um, Vietnam. We're going to get ourselves an ideology. Mm. See, we're going to get it off the shelf. See, consumerism. And we're going to have a book, and it's going to be called Character Training. See? Mm. And we're going to have a bunch of blokes who are going to actually sell character training to 20-year-old recruits. But you were pretty good at it, weren't you? We picked the chaplains. Yeah. (laughs) Not the psychologists. Mm. Not the medical corps. Not the education corps. The chaplains. Yeah. You see? So we all put on the brakes. It. I mean, we, 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 it was easy to be good at when you've got mm. 20-year-olds, for God's sake, yeah. who are thoughtful. Mm. See, religion's at its best when it accepts the fact that, the, that people are thoughtful. Yeah. And religion should, in fact, be the key. Mm. See, because we've got the, what do you call it? We've got the, we've got the form. We've been around 5,000 years, most, most of the religions, aren't they? Five? Buddhism is five, is it? But you did things like um, set up a little altar on the bonnet of a jeep, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, but you had to do it. See, this is but the point. But then you forgot to put the brake on. Well, well, that's what they say. But, I mean, we also did things like, you know, they rave about confessions, not the, you know, ghastly. But, but it wasn't. A confession was a stand-up show where, in fact, somebody said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I haven't been in a confession for 10 years. And I'd say, well, listen, don't say any more. Because Jesus loves you and forgives you your sins. The church loves you and forgives you your sins. And I, I'm not going to forgive you your sins. I declare you to be forgiven. That's all I'm telling. That's what I want to do here and I want to do in Flinders Lane. I want to do anywhere with you, mm. with anybody. What's your job? Mm. My job is to make sure that you feel reassured that everything's all right. Mm. Isn't it? No, but I've got to tell you the details. No, you don't. You're already swimming in them. <laughs> Why the hell do you want to tell them, see? So all those things, and even the bread and wine, see? I mean, the bread and wine is supposed to be, look, take this, break the bread, share the cup. Don't let the clerics get their hands on it. Because the clerics will turn the bread into, uh, what do you call it, little hosts? Neat and tidy, you see? And the clerics will also need a golden cup. See what I mean? Now, the clerics will, 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 will kill all, this, all those rituals, see? And that's the Roman model, is to take it all over. Without me, you can't do anything, see? Whereas you know damn well that you'd be better off with a loaf of bread, isn't it? And you tear the bread and somebody says, oh, that's a bit gross. I say, well, that's a life, my son, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's what mummy's trying to tell the kiddies. Mummy's been torn to pieces, kiddies, see? Mm-hmm. 
Well, you'll have to be torn to pieces for the rest of the family and for the neighbourhood. Take and eat, isn't it? And it's the same with the wine. Crushed. Well, yeah. Why didn't they have lemonade? Mm. Because wine's a funny thing that you can't get without destroying the grapes, isn't it? Mm. See? So take this. This is my blood, he said, the founder of the firm. And they said, oh, what about the sheep? It's supposed to have its throat cut. Blood. No. He said, forget about it. Enough blood. This is my blood. Nobody else has shed blood. See? So that's what your Christians do. race around the world with a bag full of bread and a bottle full of wine mm. and say no more blood. See? And with communion. Boring. Boring. <laughs> yeah, they're bored in the back. Go on. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people really enjoyed communion when you used to um, give them wafers and wine, and then mm. you used to slip them a video of Collingwood's last. Oh, game that was well. only on yeah. one. It's, look, I mean, yeah. Jesus said to his disciples, you know. No, he didn't say give them a video of Collingwood. But, uh, <laughs> well, look, he said to the bloke, "What do you want, son?" He said, oh, "I've been lying on this bloody stretcher for thirty years." He said, "Look, pick the bloody thing up and go home, for God's sake. You know, you're boring yourself to death." Oh, I'm disabled. He said, you're not disabled, you're disabled. Differently abled. Mm. Isn't it? Yep. So he's still lying on the thing, but he's differently abled. See? And it's the same with that video. I think there was an old woman down at... Uh, in, the, in the congregation. South Melbourne's uh, tough, tough. Housing ministry, blue collar. South. That's before the Renaissance. And then I think one of the... I knew she was a, a fanatic, but she couldn't afford the... Uh, what do you call it? The DVDs, isn't it? Couldn't afford it. And I had a bloke who was Mr Big. He was making them for everybody. And I said... Uh, he said, I'll send you the... Every week you'll get the, the latest DVD, see? So I used to think, no, that'd be nice if she could... And you couldn't guarantee that she'd stay long enough for after mass to get it, you know what I mean? So it was a meeting place. I've always believed that the Muslims have got a better idea of what goes on in church spaces than we have because they have a mosque, isn't it, where you meet, isn't it? Mm, and um, the Jews probably have. Any Jews that were meeting in the synagogue? Mm. Whereas the Roman church was getting very, you know, shh, you can't say that in the church because Jesus is up there mm. in the, behind the gold yeah. and there's a red light. <laughs> Tells you that, shh. All that stuff, see? Eh? That's one, one reason we got thrown out, because we tur turned the place into a bit of too much talk, too much laughing, too much this, too much that, too much the other thing, you see? Mm. And you shouldn't be doing that. Sure. It's sad. That's, that's sad. Because you've got to have places to meet. See? Thank you, yeah. Mr Wheeler. Mm. <laughs> you've got to have places to meet, you see, and unfortunately we're British, which means we have to be neat and tidy as well. Have a look. Mm. How many? <laughs> 250 people all in lines. Yeah. <laughs> well, at that point... Oh, is it over or what? <laughs> it is over, by God, it is. Well, I'm handing it over to someone else to ask oh, questions. Oh, darling. I've, I've failed terribly, what so about the, I'm, I'm going to ask... What about the dismissal? So we're just going to... We're just gonna we're just gonna throw it open to other people to ask questions if you'd like to ask a question because we've got another fifteen minutes. Yeah, sorry about that talking. No, over. no, no, that's good. Sorry about. I am if sorry. anybody would like to ask Father Bob anything, really, it's a bit feral talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the dismissal. Ah, oh, the dismissal. It's boring. You don't want to know about the dismissal. It's boring. It's boring. He said, "Yeah, I don't like what you're doing down there." And I said, well, phew, I think you're making a mistake because we're halfway through, see? Because we'd almost fallen in love with the neighbourhood and the neighbourhood has almost fallen in love with us. And I thought that that was the aim of the founder of the firm and the Roman Catholic Church, to become, in, what's the word? In, 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 uh, located, to become incarnate, incarnate, whatever the bloody word is. You become local. That's the main aim. If you become local, the theory is that you'll die happy. If you're not local, you'll die unhappy. Strange thing, and it? it's pretty simple. So he said, I don't give a rat's. He said, we have to be Roman. So I mean, I said, well, like McDonald's. We'll have to wear the same uniform, have the same menu, and you know what I mean? He said, yes. So I said, all right. So anyway, we got a couple of years out of that, and, and then by the 1-2-12, uh, then the time came, we locked the doors and left. 
went down the street to uh, to a place that the rent is paid by the Electrical Trades Union, and um, we grabbed the foundation, which they hated because it's secular. They don't like secular things. Up until 2000, however, they loved it. But they went off like a bottle of stale milk about the secular. See what I mean? Well, there's nothing you can do about that. Once the bosses go off like bottles of stale milk, <laughs> then we're done. See? But you still go back to the church quite often, don't you? Oh, I go back, but the rumour is now that they've almost got rid of the last vestige of of, uh, Bob Maguireism. They've installed pest controllers, (laughs) which is all right. I'm not saying nothing. I'm simply saying that's if you look, management does what management wants, Mm. isn't it? And that's what they've done. But it's a, it's 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 they feel as though they they need to get rid of the last vestiges of, uh, of 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 what they think is personal. Mm. It's not personal because we had a team. Same mm. as that book, I begged you on my knees, didn't I? I said, listen, I don't mind, write the book by all means, but it should come out as a manual. A manual. Anybody wants to try this? The, that'll give you an idea of uh, the pitfalls. That'll give you an idea of what you can hope for. See, because we're still open which is why we grabbed the baby and ran away with the baby, the foundation, Father Bob Maguire Foundation. It's only named after me because everybody else was giving me the impression that you couldn't be trusted. So I decided at the age of whatever it was, 70 or something, 75, that you better start working out whether you trust yourself. And the best way you can do that, more or less, was to smack your name on things and say, well, this is, this is where I stand, <laughs> the line in the sand, see? So even the documentary that's coming out at the end of July <laughs> is called In Bob We Trust, for God's sake. Because <laughs> I decided that all the bosses were saying, don't trust him, don't trust him, and I thought, well, I'll get a magnetic sign from Sinorama, free, and put it on the car door. <laughs> See, I'm not frightened of me. And it had In Bob We Trust. And then, of course, the bosses are looking and say, there he is, have a look at this. Well, you're showing off again, you know. But, I mean, I was only showing off the wounds in my hands and my feet. That's all. Mm. The same as the founder of the firm, apparently walking around somewhere with the bloody, he's still got his, the holes in his hands and his feet. Mm. Whereas the father said to the, to, to the founder of the firm, they said, for God's sake, I mean, when you left here, you were all right. <laughs> Coming back in here, for God's sake, with holes in your bloody hands and feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. And yeah. the argument goes on and on. It's going on till today in the religions. You see? The father says, listen, we've got a cosmetic department here. Get rid of the bloody things. See, because you're frightening the natives. And he said, I'm not frightening the natives because the natives have all got holes in their hands and feet. Isn't it? See? I'm only frightening the bloody angels. See? And they don't matter because they're only supposed to be here as public servants. <laughs> See? Now that's a bit, is that a bit, it is, isn't it? But I like that because it's a nice summary, you know what I mean? Of um, what's going on in Canberra tonight. Mm. See? Who's got the holes in their hands and their feet? We've got another question over there. Did so I answer that woman's question? Uh, kind of. Father, yep. Father Bob, just a quick Sorry question about, about um, Parliament tonight. Where is she? Just up here. Oh, yeah, there you are. What um, advice would you give either Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd right now if you were the chaplain of federal politics? And oh, secondarily, <laughs> what penance oh, would you, you give to Kevin Oh, you don't need to say, look, you know, I mean, you say something pious like, do no harm and do a bit of good. First, do no harm. Now, that might mean leave everything as it is, you see, and we're all in this together and one for all and all for one and, you know, the light on the hill and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know what they can do because the atmosphere is entirely toxic. So the whole, most of the media has told us that they're all clowns and they can't do nothing. And you still look at the scoreboard and the bloody scoreboard still tells us that this is the most affluent country in the universe. Now, I don't know what you do with the scoreboard. You can either deny the scoreboard, see, or those, what those blokes, the independents, have, have some, some British commentators said, you know, well, this is going on all around the world, minority government. 
Mm. Because minority government keeps everybody what, honest because they have to negotiate. And that's what the boys don't like to do. They don't like negotiations. See? Mm. Uh, the women are negotiators, isn't it? And the blokes are kind of, they've got to, you know, compete. But that's what I'd be saying, but is there a result? There is a, there's a result on, there's a spill, isn't there? But, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what you do with the Westminster model. Because a lot of young people are turning fascist. But you've got Because they're sick of it, you see. They were just mm. like somebody, and this is what happened in the 30s and the 20s in, in mm. Europe. Up popped a lad off Hitler. He said, I'll look after everything for you. I'll make sure that the autobahns of Mussolini popped up and said, I'll make sure the trains are on time. And they, you've, you know, that's, you've got quite a good idea for solving the issues with asylum seekers, haven't you? Oh, no, I just said the churches, the religion, should put their money where their mouth is and hire a buy or something, a fleet of ships, mm. and go and meet them. Mm. And give them all Collingwood jumpers. Give them Collingwood jumpers. <laughs> Or give them something, a membership card for some AFL or v, uh, what do you call it, uh, what's that rugby, NRL team, and then the, 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 the Aussies will fall all over them, isn't it? Mm. So you got to, if you can't convince the Aussies, you have to confuse them, <laughs> isn't it? You know what I mean? Because we're humble, poor little souls. We've only been here for 200 white years, mm. isn't it? We've only been, we're only babies. This is, a, this is a, what do you call it? The same as Roman Catholicism, and I think I like that, what do you call it, the synergy between, Roman, between Catholicism and Australianism because both of them are, uh, what, on, I think on the eve of a great transformation, you know? And it would be awful if some, somebody comes and stamps, stomps it out. Well, it's just getting... Going, you know, that's why the, the younger generation, you see, I mean, God knows why we've got to learn to trust the younger generation with the future of the country and the future of the church. So you've mm. almost got to occupy Catholicism and you've also got to occupy Australia. Mm. See? Don't leave it to anybody. You see? Think for yourself, character training. One thing character training said to soldiers. Because you had to avoid the British tradition was Sir Do's best, you know, which led to Gallipoli. Mm. You said the charge of the light brigade. You know what I mean? And you had to, you, you had to avoid the American uh, heresy, which is we'll bomb the shit out of them. <laughs> so you've still got in Vietnam today people suffering for the after effects of, uh, what do you call it? Agent Orange. Mm. See what I mean? And we've got another question up the back. Not really a question, more of a comment. Um, ignore Safran, Father Bob, you're never boring. <laughs> no, but I think he's onto something, though. He's onto something, you know. Cause he, but, but then I find going around, like, tomorrow there'll be a few teachers from a school in the western suburbs. And the other night we had a lovely show at um, that lovely church, Anglican church in, um, in, 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 Bar, in, Bar, in uh, Ackland Street in St Kilda, where kids came from Albury, I think it was, Albury High School, year 12s, 60 of them for an hour. You know, and I go in humbly because I want to learn from them. See, the teacher thinks I'm going to teach them things. <laughs> See, but the kids know more. You know, well, the kids have forgotten more than I've ever learnt because they happen to be this generation that knows everything, <laughs> isn't it? Because one press of the thing, isn't it? Yeah. And they've got access, they tell me, you tell me if I'm wrong, mm. they've got access to all, isn't it? The accumulated wisdom, the knowledge, sorry, of the human goddamn race. It's at their mm. fingertips. Mm. Huh? But what's missing? Wisdom. <laughs> See? Which is why you have got to kind of stay around as long as you can. <laughs> See? Don't shuffle off your mortal coil, as my father was saying. You see, because we need you. Every older person is needed. Each old person has still got the scrap of the DNA. You have a look in your little fist. And you probably, you may not have been able to, what's the word, what's the word, share it. You see? Which is why when you go and visit the poor old, whoever it is, who's suffering from dementia, in fact, don't go, folks, because the best is yet to come. Because there'll either be, it might not be a word, 
But there's likely to be a gleam in the eye, or there's likely to be a quiver of the lip, or there's likely to be, if you're game, to break the kind of the taboo in the West, you might actually hold hands. See what I mean? Which is what the women have to teach us. The blokes, you see. Simple thing I said to you the other day, didn't I? I see you look at that bloke cross on the street. It wasn't he with his kid holding their hands. I said, I think that's what us old ones probably need. Somebody take our hand and walk us. See? Mm. It's like that bloody thing there. Every time I get onto that, what's that thing? The wheeler. The wheeler. <laughs> the wheelie frame or the stick or the, or the wheelchair, if, if, if that's the stage you're at. You see, it's almost a contest physically. Oh, God, I'm gonna shut up. Well, why doesn't somebody get hold of you and say, hey, come with me? Like when you were a baby. See? Because mm. you get the reassurance. When I was lying in Cabrini, you got your violin. <laughs> with this mysterious, what is it called? Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. I love that. I love that. There he is, the media tart. What's he got? <laughs> Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Why couldn't he have something simple? <laughs> Cancer. <laughs> Bloody polyneuropathy. But I'm lying there thinking when I thought, oh. And then I thought, hey, I know what I'll invent. I'll invent a prosthetic hand. So instead of just having, uh, there's your glass of water, there's your pills for your bowels, there's something, and there's something, and something, and I said, what about a prosthetic hand? She said, excuse me. I said, well, nobody else is offering me theirs. Isn't it? See? So give us a bloody prosthetic hand, and when I'm lying in the bed, like the old days when you were a baby and you had the uh, teddy bear, isn't it? Something to hang on to. To give you at least the impression, because we're, we're animal, vegetable, and mineral long before we're human, isn't it? Intellectual, isn't it? You need reassurance, isn't it? See what I mean? As they tell you when you've got people in palliative care. And they look as though they're gone for all money, they're gone. And guess what, folks, what? We're going to design the palliative care place with a kitchen in the middle. The dining room will be in the centre and every... <gasps> Even those who look as though they're almost on the verge of leaving. Once they smell the food. <laughs> See what I mean? They'll let you wheel them down to, as long as they go to the table. <laughs> See, isn't it fun? We funny poor little buggers. Mm. See? But, the be but you'd never dream of that unless you were that down to earth that it is heavenly, isn't it? And that's the mystery, I think, as far as I'm concerned. The more you... I was thinking to myself the other day, listen, instead of going up there to the church and walking in the back door and seeing the red light and the icons and the new confessional that's been installed in St Peter's and Paul's church... So let's do something revolutionary. Now that the secular humanist's gone, what are you going to do? We're going to install a confessional. Says, Hello, who? what for the priests? You know? <laughs> they said, get out. <laughs> Typical buddy. But I'm saying that the, the, the ordinary, I was looking and I was thinking to myself, I think I've found, I would find, uh, what? God. God. Uh, on the corner of... Um, of Flinders Street and uh, Swanson Street, surrounded by humans. Uh, more, what's the word, more, uh, more reassuringly than I would find if I walked into beautiful St Paul's Cathedral or into uh, St Patrick's Cathedral. Or, it's strange, that, isn't it? Because there was a bloke who wrote books, um, Thomas Merton. Ever heard of Thomas Merton? I think he was a, he was a, 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 a Carthusian monk which meant he was supposed to be um, silent most of the year. But he, he was starting to write books about, he said, well, strangely, that beautiful monastery, Gethsemane it was called, beautiful, you know, naturally beautiful. He said, oh, I had to go for a dentist appointment in town and I stand on the corner of whatever it was and whatever it is in New York, people everywhere. And he said, I felt closer to God there than I felt in the chapel at Gethsemane. Mm. Yeah. See? Now, to me, that's the jackpot. You see what I mean? 
So if the church says, well, get out of there, because we had just got to the stage where people were starting to come into the church precinct as though it was theirs. Mm. See? So you had street kids. You even had the great blessing, now don't take this wrongly, of Stephen Cooper, who hung himself mm. from the tree. See? Aged 40. See? Couldn't go any further in life. See, if he looked back, he saw nothing. If he looked forward, unfortunately, he could see nothing. And he chose to end it on the patch. Mm. See, and I said to somebody, Jesus, that's, that's an awful indictment of, no, 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 he said, you're missing, this is one of the locals. No, 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 you're misinterpreting it, he said. He said, what he's done is to show an act of great confidence. That this is the place where he found he, himself to this stage. And he's satisfied that's the end of the station. Mm. Huh? Thank you so much, Bob. That's I'm the so end of sorry, me, that's Russell. the end of the evening. Yeah. As well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of that. Oh. Adam. Now, thank you, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, because you've allowed us the, haven't you? You've allowed me once again uh, to indulge myself, so to speak, because uh, it's a lonely thing, this being a Roman Catholic priest, because we're under great, you know what I mean, they're all pedophiles and all this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, no, well, that's the, the problem there. But when you come out to a, a bunch of human beings like yourself, well, that's where I found Mm. Tonight found God. So thank you. Thank you. As and Bob's going to be signing you. books. Oh, we're going to sign too, books. If he wants to. Yeah. Right. Ta da! Thank you.